Back, I'm a graduate research assistant, first year here at Iowa State in the Natural Resources Ecology and Management Department. Um, my major is environmental science, but I have a forestry background. I was a field forester for a number of years, so I'm really excited to be here. It's good to be back amongst uh, fellow foresters. So um, today I'm going to be talking about the project that I've been involved with um, for the past, oh, a little under a year. Um, processes controlling the source, movement, and release of soil phosphorus uh, in Midwestern streams from pasture and cropland. So real quick, um, I just want to touch on phosphorus uh, a little bit, tell you why we're doing this, um, why we're interested in, in it in the first place, and then kind of just give you a quick rundown of my project, uh, going through the watershed, the background, our goals, method, whatnot. And then the, really, the big thing I wanted to do today is tie it back to agroforestry. I think that water quality, uh, bank erosion, all that kind of stuff has a definite link to agroforestry, um, especially riparian buffers. So a little bit about phosphorus. Um, why are we looking at this? It's consistently ranked as a top cause of surface water degradation, especially in the agricultural Midwest. Um, it contributes to the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia, that large dead zone off the coast of Louisiana, as well as regional algal blooms. Uh, to the point that in 2008, 45% reduction in riverine phosphorus levels was recommended by the Gulf of Mexico Watershed Nutrient Task Force. And agriculture is a source of phosphorus, especially in areas of high manure application, areas with a lot of CAFOs, confined animal feeding, um, poultry litter, and whatnot. Here's the dead zone. Probably you all have seen this before, an anoxic region off the coast of Louisiana. Uh, main driver behind this, or one of the big drivers, is nutrients coming out the Mississippi River. Um, that was always very far away to me. You know, the Gulf of Mexico might as well be on Mars. But um, this hit home a few years ago. I was living in central Kansas when phosphorus really came to my attention. I was working for, as a forester at this time, too. Um, Milford Lake, the biggest lake in Kansas. Grand Lake, Oklahoma, um, which I believe is the third largest city in Oklahoma on weekends and holidays. Um, started getting these terrible al uh, toxic algal blooms in the summer. Um, this was a huge economic hit to these, re these little towns that surround these lakes because they were shutting it down. I think Grand Lake was shut down over Fourth of July one year, parts of Grand Lake. So this was getting pretty bad. I, I know a few dogs died from drinking the water. Um, so phosphorus in the water, toxic algal blooms, um, not good for anybody really. So phosphorus can move in any ways. It can move attached to sediment or it can move in the dissolved form. Um, attached to sediment, you've got surface runoff, you've got stream bank erosion, and you've got movement within the channel um, as attached to sediment. Dissolved, same thing, it can move across the surface of the earth, also through groundwater and subsurface tile drainage. Um, evidence is building over the years that stream bank and bed erosion is becoming a, a potential top source. They think this is probably the biggest uh, contributor of phosphorus, is the banks and the bed, the sediment in the channel itself. So saying that, studies are needed that um, aid in targeting conservation practices based on sediment and soil characteristics, uh, looking at where bank erosion is occurring, where these phosphorus hotspots are, and focusing on that. So we'll get into my study here, or our study, I should say. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on the Walnut Creek watershed. This is a really exciting place to work. Um, it's in Jasper County, Iowa, just east of Des Moines. It's on the southern Iowa drift plain. Walnut Creek is a perennial warm water stream. It's about 5,200 hectares. It dumps into the Des Moines River about six miles or so south of, of our southern gauge station. The land cover is 54% row crop, 36% grassland, and 4% forest, um, riparian and oak savanna. They've got a lot of restored oak savanna in this area. It's pretty neat. Uh, channel length for our study is the red. It's about 13.2 kilometers. Average channel width is 8 meters. And in the heart of this, the purple, is the Neil Smith National Re Wildlife Refuge, which is a really great place. I'll put a plug in for it. If you haven't been there, it's, it's kind of like a nice oasis in the, in the middle of Jasper County here. Um, long story short, it was uh, supposed to be a nuclear facility until Chernobyl happened. They had all this land. Uh, Neil Smith, a politician from Iowa, wanted to create a tall grass prairie National Wildlife Refuge in Iowa. And that's uh, where we're at now. They've been slowly planting this to native tall grass prairie. Um, so it's really cool in that we can study phosphorus in the context of this you know, immense 
hydrologic and land use alteration that's happened over the past 150 years uh, and restoration, putting it back into native um, vegetation. So it's not really a practical BMP, but it does to the new RP and some other practices that are out there uh, in the world. In, in terms of alteration in Iowa, it's been massive. You know, we've cleared, um, took all the perennial vegetation off the, the surface of the earth, replaced it with row crops that have low infiltration rate for the soil, uh, channelized waterways, drained wetlands, um, all kinds of things that have really shifted the hydrology of these streams. Oh, another great thing about working down here, we've got two stream gauging stations, one at the north end, one at the south end, that's got almost near contiguous or continuous water quality data going back to 1995. So I think that's pretty rare. And it's pretty, uh, we've got some really expert folks from the National Lab for Ag and Environment in Ames here that um, handle all that. So that's really nice to have that data set. So the headwaters of the watershed where we start working, there's a little bit of grazing, active grazing, um, and row crop. That's the primary land use up at the, the, the northern end. As you get down to the heart of the refuge, you can see here we've got tall grass prairie, warm season grass in the uplands. As you get into the lowland riparian area, we've got cool season grass kind of buffer strip that dominates, a very thick mat of primarily reed canary grass. And as you can see here, it's been heavily, heavily channelized. Walnut Creek in this area. As you get down to the southern end, we've got more thick riparian forest. Typical stuff, box elder, um, hackberry, green ash, a few scattered large cottonwood and silver maple, um, elm, and some mid-story box, uh, box elder and buckeye. So we've got two main project goals. Number one, is to identify and quantify the key processes controlling the release and transport of phosphorus in mid Midwestern streams. Number two is identify these hot spots in the watershed based on soil and sediment characteristics that we know are delivering the most amount of phosphorus and that we can target these with specific BMPs. So it's not just about ide identifying sub-watersheds where the phosphorus is coming from, it's looking within a sub-watershed and pinpointing specific sites where we can work. And of course, the long-term goal is sustainable Midwest agriculture. And to me, that means we get good water quality, we don't put excessive constraints on farmers, and we don't negatively impact their bottom line. Basically, that's the idea I've got in my head. So, so specific, specific objectives, there's four of them. Number one, quantify annual flux of sediment-bound phosphorus from channel erosion. In other words, how much phosphorus is coming from the stream banks and the stream bed itself. Two, quantify annual flux of soluble P. Where's the dissolved phosphorus coming from? Overland flow, tile drainage, et cetera. Three, uh, my fellow student, Soroso Rahutomo, is dealing with this. It's pretty sophisticated. But essentially, he's looking at what, can, what uh, characteristics of the in-channel sediment, as well as what conditions of the water column above that, lead to phosphorus attaching itself to sediment or releasing itself from, from sediment. So if he knows the conditions and the characteristics, we can kind of pinpoint where phosphorus sources and sinks are in the channel itself based on the bed sediment and the water column. And finally, estimate the net contributions of channel, groundwater, and overland flow sources of P-loads. This is kind of putting it all together, uh, making a phosphorus budget, and then kind of seeing where these hot spots are, and then we can target BMPs. So for today, for time, I'm just going to go over objective one, which is looking at channel erosion stream banks and the bed. That's what, primarily what I've been doing for the past eight months. Um, if you've got any questions on the other objectives, please, I'll, I'll be here all week. So. Um, so one big, big component of this is assessing the stream bank contributions of phosphorus, stream bank erosion. What we did, well, I didn't do this, but before I got here, um, they walked the entire channel and picked out essentially the worst of the worst eroding stream banks based on NRCS protocol. We took 20% of those and then we installed these stream bank pins. They're 30 inches long and about the diameter of a pencil at a two meter spacing along these banks. These banks range anywhere from 14 to well over 200 meters in length. We've got 61 total banks and a little shy of 3,000 erosion pins that we put in. 
Now horizontally, they're spaced two meters, but vertically, this is very important. They are targeted toward these different stratigraphic members, different alluvial layers that were laid down over the millennia starting about 10,500 years ago. As you can see, my fellow student Morgan Davis here is pointing them out. The bottom one here is about 10,500 years old. That's the Gunder member. The middle one here, that dark, was the original prairie soil, the Roberts Creek member. And the top here is all the erosion that's happened since we've been farming the, the land for about the next past 150 years, post-settlement alluvium. And it can be a meter thick some parts in the, uh, the watershed. Incredibly impressive how big that is. And real quick, um, we measure the, the full set twice a year. We've got a focused subset that we measure after high flow events or once monthly. Again, up and down the watershed, it's very clear the breaks of these members. It's almost like a big layer cake. Um, as you can see here, here's the Camp Creek member, 400 years of present. That's the post-settlement alluvium. Roberts Creek, 3,500 3, to 500 before present right here. And here's the start of the Gunder, 10,000 to 4,500 years ago. The Camp Creek's pretty amazing. It has absolutely no structure. If you pick it up in your hand, it turns to dust. Roberts Creek has a good deal of structure. So does Gunder, but Gunder has a high clay content, high sand content. It's very compact, very dense. When you're walking in the stream bed, it feels like you're on wet rocks or something. It's actually quite treacherous. Camp Creek member, you can actually see almost the individual flood events if you look close, like rings in a tree. It's, it's pretty neat. Again, Roberts Creek member, that real dark. This is key because we're very interested on how each one of these members erodes and delivers phosphorus to the channel. Here's the gunder, as you can see, a lot of mottling. Um, there'll be even organic matter, old root channels in here. It's pretty interesting. <clears throat> Up and down again, the layering is, is pretty, pretty obvious here. Here's the gunder, Roberts. Another real neat thing we're doing is we're using ground-based LIDAR on six of the banks so we can compare what the LIDAR is telling us to what the pins are telling us. The pins are great, but they're kind of labor intensive, um, time consuming. Um, the LIDAR on the other hand is very expensive, but it is not time consuming and it's very, very accurate. So this is really neat. I'm really excited we're, we're getting involved with this. Another thing we're looking at is the channel shape change over the years. We've got permanent cross sections established up and down the channel, I think uh, well over 40. Going back to 1998, <clears throat> so this past fall we did a remeasurement of those. Uh, we just basically strung a tape from bank to bank, took a stadia rod and recorded depth. And we get these nice channel cross section diagrams here. As you can see, the vast, the black is 1998, the white 2014. The vast majority of these cross sections have gotten a little bit deeper and much wider. These are, this is in feet. This particular reach has gotten 15 feet wider over the past, uh, since 1998. So this is really important to know uh, because as that channel moves and shifts, it's moving a lot of sediment with it, a lot of phosphorus. <clears throat> so we'll continue to do this throughout the four years that I'll be here, at least once a year. Uh, we'll probably do a subset of these after some major um, flow events. Another thing we wanted to do is look at how, what is the volume of sediment that's sitting in the channel itself uh, and how much phosphorus does that c uh, con contain. So what we did, we broke the watershed up into 240 meter reaches based on some IDNR, Iowa DNR protocol and we basically took a scored or an increment tile probe and we, w we started bank full width and went and we probed down until we hit that super compact gunder member. That's what we're calling kind of the base of our storage, is that gunder member. Anything above the gunder, we're considering sediment that is available to be mobilized downstream. So we went and we probed down to that gunder and we got a volume of all these cross sections which we will expand to the entire water, or to the entire main channel. Another neat thing we did with this is we broke the sediment up into classes. So we got a volume we're going to break it up into classes. For example, here we would call this like loose bottom sediment. It's based on features. Here we would call slump material that has fallen down from above. Something like this we'd call maybe a, a point bar. Something in the middle of mid-channel mid bar. We're also looking at beaver dams and debris jams uh, as well. So we're going to get a volume and categories of that volume at the end. 
And when we're done, we're going to go back and take a, a very um, in-depth uh, soil sample array up and down this to look at a variety of soil analysis. <clears throat> so here's what we're looking at. You can see here's the Gunder member. We took a soil core. Here's the, uh, the sitting above in the channel, some loose sediment that is potentially uh, ready to be mobilized. So that's kind of what we're probing down and hitting that, hitting that gunner. That's what we're calling the storage. So I really want to make this relevant to agroforestry. In my mind, the channel, stream bank erosion, and repairing trees really go hand in hand. Um, so what we're going to know at the end of this, we're going to get a really good estimate of how each member erodes and behaves over time, the characteristics, texture, whatnot of each member, and the depth of each member. We're also going to know that how the channel shape, the cross sections, and the storage change over time. So I think that's going to give us a really good idea on how to target repairing buffers to be optimal for stream bank stabilization. I'll get to that in a second. As well as selecting the correct species, which will stabilize the banks most appropriately. <clears throat> and it kind of all starts with this channel evolution model. This is from Shum, 1984. This is basically how a channel reacts to a disturbance over time. Up here, say this is probably, oh, the year 1500 or something, um, before um, settlers got here. The disturbance in this case was the complete hydrologic alteration of the landscape. You know, we removed the perennial vegetation. We tile drained things. We channelized everything. Uh, we had a lot more impervious surface. We had a lot more row crops, which have a, a lower infiltration rate. So what happens? A ton more water starts coming into the channel at a different frequency. So what's the channel got to do? It has to get bigger to accept this. The first thing it does, it starts down cutting. When it down cuts to a point where it cannot down cut anymore, say like our Gunder member, it starts to get wider. This is where you see the massive amounts of bank erosion um, going on. Over time, the wall's kind of slump in, it's stabilizing. You're starting to form a floodplain at a lower level. And then finally, we get back to a stable situation where the channel, again, it can accept the new water regime. It's got a floodplain at a lower level and a terrace here, which used to be the old floodplain. <clears throat> so how does this kind of fit into how do we target buffers? You know, when I was in the field working with landowners, I saw this all the time. Everybody had this situation going on. And I just saw forests falling into the creek, literally, uh, just at the same rate it seemed like as cornfields and grass. So I was like, what the heck is going on out here? I'm trying to promote trees, and they're all falling into the river. They're not doing very good. Um, a little background on that. <clears throat> 2004, George Zames did a study in Bear Creek, which we'll go to tomorrow, looking at the effectiveness of vegetated buffers on stream bank erosion. He found that they were very, very effective at it, especially forests. In 2013, Jason Palmer did a study down in Walnut Creek, where I'm at, and he found that buffers and land cover really weren't significant in the er erosion rates. In fact, forest was the highest uh, erosion rate of all the vegetation types. I heard this at a conference, and I felt kind of bummed out, because that's not what I want to hear when I'm trying to promote trees along creeks. So what it depended on then, what the factor was, is that Bear Creek was in this 4 to 5 region stabilizing and stable, where trees are critical, grass repairing buffers are critical to stabilize the bank. Where we are now, we're in the widening phase. As you can remember that cross section I showed you, the channel is definitely getting wider. So trees not doing a very good job here. So if we can know the erosion rates of the members, we can kind of predict in the future, we can either assess where we're at now and predict in the future what's going to happen. For example, the final bank height here, depending on the member depth. So we can, I think we can effectively target, we can locate these areas in a watershed that are stabilizing and stable, or through a lot of effort, we could speed up the evolution, create this situation, and then go back in and plant riparian buffers to stabilize the bank. So they're, at, they're critical here and here for stream bank stabilization, but here they can be very challenging. And again, the bank height based on members potentially could be used to determine what vegetation type you put on the ground. Be it trees, say it's over three or four foot, you probably need trees in there. 
under three foot grass or shrubs might do the job. So again, I think this is going to be really neat to see how these different soil types erode and how we can predict um, where phosphorus hotspots are and then work to stabilize them with these BMPs in the future. So I got a lot of people to thank. Uh, of course, Iowa State, great place, great people to be around. Um, and with that, here's some widening. <laughs> Uh, I thank you very much. I'm probably pretty early, but uh, am I good? Okay. I'll take questions if you'd like. <clears throat> Rather than uh, creating an artificial scenario to hasten the, the progress, uh, did you consider any bioengineering options with the trees? Because bioengineering can prevent the widening of the streams and, and, and yeah, that is true. That's always an option. Um, I guess you would have to, my, my concern is always that you're stabilizing a small part of an unstable system, but I'm not, a, I'm not an engineering okay. person at all. But uh, I just, I saw a lot of that on the ground back in Kansas when I was working. It just seemed like you're stabilizing this one small spot of an, in, an unstable reach. No, you're stabilizing it. Yeah, correct. The entire, yeah. It's very costly, yeah. Okay. And the, another interesting, just a comment, uh, we, uh, the first conference was in, in Canada in 1989 at the Washington Creek, and, and uh, Joe, Dr. Joe Pauci and Dick Schultz developed the program in Iowa after the <coughs> conference they attended in 1989. And we, are, we found that even though you know, there was a nine kilometer length, and we rehabilitated only 1.6 kilometers, but cutting the light with the, the shade created by the trees, uh, completely eliminated the algae bloom in, in one section huh. that was rehabilitated, even though the phosphorus and nitrogen concentrations were high. Interesting. Yeah. So that's another option that uh, we took some, I, I have not published that yet, but we took some what they call the eye, fish eye lens photographs to assess the amount of shade. I could send you that, that uh, report. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. I'll find you. Yeah. Any other questions? I believe at this point, my hypothesis is that the most, most of it is coming from the bed and the bank erosion. <clears throat> but there is some delivered through surface runoff dissolved, tile flow dissolved, and groundwater dissolved. And we're looking at that as well. <clears throat> I haven't started that yet. So for time, I was kind of just focusing on the banks. But no, I'm, I'm really excited to see what's coming out of the tiles and what's coming out of the wells that we've got out there. So that should be, that should be pretty exciting. So. But for me, I say bank right now is, is my hypothesis. One more quick question. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>